Hello, we're, we're here, it finally worked. Uh, my name is Mark Okran, and I'd like to welcome you to this Escape Velocity Extra program on communicating with Klingons. Uh, my connection to that sort of communication is that I developed the Klingon language that's been used in Star Trek, starting with Star Trek III. Search for Spock, that was 36 years ago, which is a little bit scary. But there were Klingons before that, and even Klingons speaking their own language more or less before that. So I thought I'd give a little bit of background first, and then we'll get together with these other guys. Uh, Klingons first appeared in 1967 during the first season of the original Star Trek in an episode called Errand of Mercy. And they popped up in the original series only maybe five more, in five more episodes, and a couple of animated, the original animated show in, in 73, 74. And they were described as a warrior race. And what we learned about them is that they're mean and fierce and not nice. And though there's hints and suggestions of what's to come, we didn't learn a whole lot more about them and, and, and their culture and history. But we did learn one more thing, at least it was of interest to me, in The Trouble with Tribbles, which was only the second time that the Klingons appeared. Uh, we found out that they speak something they call Klingonese, or actually the way the guy says is Klingonese, but I don't know what that's all about. Of course, we don't hear any Klingonese, except for a couple of names. The Klingon Korax, who talks about it, proudly proclaims that half the quadrant is learning to speak Klingonese, and then he speaks only English. And we don't hear any Klingonese in any other later episodes either, until Star Trek The Motion Picture. The opening scene of this movie that came out in uh, 1979 shows three Klingon ships moving through space, and one by one they get zapped by something or other. And then the Klingons aren't in the movie anymore, and it goes downhill. The plot of the motion picture is, of course, what happened to the Klingons. But before they disappear, we see inside one of the ships and see that the Klingons have changed a bit from what we were used to in the original series. They have new uniforms, and they have bumpy foreheads. An interesting side note on that, since I get to talk for a little while here, is one of the reasons Klingons, rather than some alien, other alien race, uh, like Romulans or something, were the go-to enemy in the original series is because their makeup was so cheap. All the, they didn't have any prosthetics. You just had to put on some face makeup and stick on some false hair, and away they go. But for the film, clearly the makeup budget was a lot bigger, so we got bumps. Anyway, besides the new look, the Klingons in this film also speak a language that no one's heard before, or at least the captain of the lead ship does. He mutters maybe, maybe eight lines, and they're all subtitles, so it's a real thing. Uh, this language was uh, invented by a guy named John Poville, who was the associate producer, along with James Doohan, Jimmy Doohan, who played Skyding all the time. And they were focusing on the sounds, didn't really work out the words, the vocabulary, the grammar, or anything like that. But we didn't learn anything that much more about the Klingons or their culture because they got zapped too soon. Anyway, a few years later, 1984, they made another movie, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. That film was written and produced by Harv Bennett, and he decided that they should speak their own language and do more than just bark out some commands now and then. So this is where I come in uh, to create a language and teach the actors how to speak it, or at least how to pronounce the lines properly. But what we learned about the Klingons otherwise is that they're still the mean, ruthless folks they were in the original series. So five years go by, and during that, well, there was a movie, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, in the meantime. Uh, they had a Klingon ship, but nobody's speaking Klingon. They only had whales, so forget that. Five years go by, and there's a new TV show called Star Trek The Next Generation. And it began airing almost exactly 33 years ago now. It was about this time of September when it started. And in thinking about this program, Gene Roddenberry, who's obviously the creator of Star Trek, said that there were supposed to be no stories featuring the old races, meaning the Vulcans, the Klingons, the Romulans, and so on, uh, at least not for a while. He said, there's a big galaxy out there. There's plenty of other folks to encounter. The character of Worf, the Klingon Worf, was added to the script of the first episode almost at the last minute. And it was, he was kind of put in to symbolize the times have changed since the original series. The Klingons were no longer just the rowdy, warlike enemy. In fact, there was a truce now. There's an alliance between the Klingons. Uh, and the Federation. So the Worf was only supposed to be in about half of the episodes uh, when they when they first started, but it turns out he producers thought he was kind of interesting and brought a lot of charisma to the show, so he became a regular right away. So maybe there is actually something about these Klingons 
that are worth looking into further. But we didn't really look into, learn more about, much more about the Klingons until about 20 episodes later into The Next Generation in an episode called Heart of Glory. And in it, uh, three Klingons were beamed aboard the Enterprise and they howl when one of them dies. And then there's a lot of talk about Klingon culture and history and what it means to be a true Klingon. And that set the stage for the elaboration of Klingon culture to follow. They also talk a little bit of Klingon uh, in that episode. I don't know where they came from. They must be from a different part of the empire. Anyway, uh, over the next few seasons, the Klingons improved their linguistic skills uh, in fits and starts, but still they did it. And they were seen to have a pretty interesting and complex culture. And they'd become a part of the next generation universe. And we saw they're not out just for a fight. They're a proud race full of tradition, placing great value on honor. And by the end of an episode called Reunion that aired uh, in November of 1990, there's a new leader of the Klingon Empire. There's a new chancellor, and his name was Gowron. And Gowron was played by Robert O'Reilly, who is here somewhere. So let's see if we can get him in here. There he is. So welcome, Bob, and, and friend. And my buddy. And your buddy, right. He, he doesn't talk today. He's shy. He might. He might. I can teach him. <laughs> in 93, a few years later, another Star Trek uh, series hit the air, Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. And over the years during that series, they had plenty of Klingons uh, to contend with. Gowron himself showed up uh, when Quark, who was the Ferengi uh, barkeep, accidentally caused some problems for the Klingons. And later, Worf joined the crew of, of Deep Space Nine because the Klingons were acting up. And Cisco, the commanding officer, uh, thought that Worf could help out. And another important Klingon showed up soon after that, except that he wasn't really a Klingon, except then he was after that. Anyway, it was this guy who also became a chancellor, and his name was Martok, played by J.G. Hertzler, who's right there. <laughs> <laughs> I always have my background music with me. Get ready, Bob. I'm ready. I'm ready. So is this guy. Boy, hey, like you blow. Boy, poop, bay, poop. Yappa, yappa, day to me. To me, ooh. Later on, ask me about that song. That was interesting. Those are my words. To me, young before we jump into whatever i'm not sure what it is that we're going to jump into uh we want to let you know that bob and jg are available for one-on-one -on -one conversations uh if anyone out there wants to talk with one or both of them Later yeah, on, uh, those will begin. Out. Those those will begin when this main part of the thing is over, which will be about about eight thirty Eastern, five thirty Pacific time, and you can still register for that for these little three minute chats up until about eight o'clock Eastern, five o'clock Pacific. Go to it's oh it's on the screen escapevelocity.events backslash evx, and you can do that. And also, as we're going along, if you have any questions, please send them in, and we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. Just type, type a text message in the box at the bottom of your screen there. All right, this event is called Communicating with Klingons. I don't know how successful I'm going to be doing that, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. Now, Bob? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> You've yeah, been yeah, a Klingon yeah. now for about 30 years. And JG, you've been a Klingon for about 25, which is a respectable bum amount of time. So you're in a great position to know what Klingons are all about. So one of the questions that I get uh, a lot is why is Klingon so popular to talk about the language? You know, why do so many people become interested in the language? My answer for that is that some people just love languages, which is why they care about Klingon. But for most of them, it's not because of the language itself. In other words, it's not they love the, the sounds or the relative clauses or something. It's because it's the language of the Klingons. As I mentioned in the original episodes, the Klingons weren't in all that many episodes, but here we are 53 years later talking about them. So what is there about Klingons that you think people like so much? Well, I, 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 you know, they are the, uh, they're the warrior, um, but they're also 
bigger than life. They're also, uh, if I, JG will probably talk on this a little bit, they're very Shakespearean. They're very heroic. Uh, um, they don't hide anything. They're out there, and that's to be admired. Uh, Shakespeare had a lot of characters like that, um, and it, they're just out there, and, and uh, they're joyous to behold. Um, they have great bar scenes and great parties and, and uh, great battles and uh, um, uh, great wars, and, and, and they keep the action going in in uh, Star Trek and have always kept the action going yeah. in Star Trek. Uh, um, uh, JG? Well, I have a feeling I disagree with you about they, uh, they just don't hold anything back because I, I basically reduce my charisma by about 95%. <laughs> because if I let go everything, you know, there would just, uh, there wouldn't be room for anybody else. On screen. Now, um, now you, you wouldn't lie like as a Klingon, would you? What's that? You wouldn't lie as a Klingon, would you? No, no. You you take care of that. Uh, yeah. You handle the lying better than anybody else on on the show. Oh, I think yeah. there he is. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. You better watch it. Uh, you know, I hope people don't get the idea, Mark, that we call each other. Bob and I call. Bob lives in Los Angeles. I live in New York, and mm -hmm. we don't call up and <laughs> and thrust and and put our <laughs> have little battles with our. our we still our, fight our, each other our on, our on, <laughs> on Zoom. Oh, on Zoom. Where are you, where are you going? By the last six months, <laughs> this is so sad. But yet the Klingon language so befits the Klingon look. I don't know. Who direct, who um who created the costume in the first place? The uh, not the not the not the dollar ninety nine costume they wore in in uh, you know the nineteen sixty six or sixty seven. But when they re entered, um, I guess in the the did you say the the third film? They they, they re entered in the first film. Yeah, first first film. But what were they wearing in the first film? Similar to what they had have worn ever since. Oh, okay. Um, that was that was created by a, an opera director, was it not? An opera I designer. Know. I don't know who was the designer. Someone will someone will write it in and. and no, yeah, it wasn't Blackman. Uh, it was not Blackman yet. It was. Um, I can't think of the dang name. It might have been but Bob Fletcher, but I'm not. They're sure. very operatic. I mean, they're huge, and they're. You know, it looks like a football uniform as well. So, uh, yeah, I was going to ask about the uniforms and 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 the makeup and all this stuff. Well, your I, language goes with that, Mark. I mean, it's well, thank so you. well. Thank you. It's larger than life. It's and it's, very damp. It's very wet. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very sloppy. You have to yeah. have to stand back. And social distancing is perfect. Yes. Um, about two hundred yards. <laughs> so, so you know, none of the three of us. Here, you know, uh, even though we've dealt with Klingons for a while, we didn't create the Klingons, right? The Klingons were created and, and presumably named, I don't know for sure, by Gene Kuhn, who was the writer of the first episode where the Klingons popped up. And the three original actors, um, or there, there may have been more than the three original ones, but there was Calicos and uh, Campbell and... Michael and Sarah. Yeah, and Sarah, too. And yeah. um, they, yeah, were, they all were all in the same episode originally, but they were all original guys. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, the, the the after the original few episodes, you know, the the culture got elaborated a lot. Uh, and part of that part of that was the language, uh, but part of that was you guys and, and the other actors who played Klingons. So, just for fun, what did you know about Klingons before you got the parts? Uh, I knew pretty much everything there was to know at the time. Uh, I mean, I wasn't overboard with it, but I mean, I, I was a fan of the original show, uh, big time. And so I knew all about that. And then a friend of mine, uh, played a Klingon. So I kind of watched that and got that John Larroquette at the time we were doing theater together. Um, <clears throat> and he, uh, he was in, uh, w one of the films and, um, Star Trek, great. Yeah. 
so so I kept up with it, and then I was curious to see uh, um, Michael Dorn in in Next Gen, uh, what he was doing, and and uh, uh, and then when Patrick, when I did the first show with Patrick, uh, Patrick was was Patrick was like we were creating um, sort of the mythology, uh, especially when somebody was was you know the the thing of pain the uh uh and i i was actually doing a lot of the physical stuff and creating the lines and stuff like that uh Lovely. patrick was very very uh generous and saying yeah do you know go for it go you know uh do and uh so i did uh so i i kind of added a little bit of uh uh Klingon history in 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 that in that that uh, show uh good, good. And Jade, what did you know about Klingons before you showed up uh they didn't exist until I showed up <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not under I'm not understanding your question um no no so you went into audition for a role did you know what the Klingons were about when you walked into that room uh, I, I really didn't care. I, uh, I went in. No, no, I really didn't know. I didn't know enough to be able to speak the language. The, um, the first time I auditioned for a Klingon was on the show that, uh, on the CD ROM that Bob was the hero of, you right. know, he was wow. the main figure in the CD ROM called Klingon. Right. You know, and it's, um, Which, uh, he has, by the way, he has several copies of that CD ROM. If anybody, could ever play it on so any. So do I. I have no machine that'll play them. <laughs> well, Bob has stacks and stacks and stacks. <laughs> right next to his uh, oh, eight tracks. He has a lot of eight tracks too. Um, yeah, yeah. But actually, Bob and I worked on that together on part of it. Because yeah, they, they flew Mark in ah. to teach me the language. Because right, because part of part of, that game, it. part of the game uh, it, it requires you to know a little bit of the language. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, so there was a, a, a third disc, which was just a language lab, which mm -hmm. went through some vocabulary and went through pronunciations. So I remember Bob and I spending all day in a garage in Burbank someplace. Yes, yeah, yeah. Going through. Well, that's a normal day for Bob. That's basically, he has, he has <laughs> the I got in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went, we went through. Talking a lot in garages. You know? yeah. We practiced the sounds. So, uh, I would, I would say, I would say, ba, 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 ba. Bob would say, ba, ba, ba. And I'd say, oh, oh, oh. And Bob would say, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and he would, you know, he would say, no, Bob, you have to spit more. You got to yeah. spit. You know, it's like, it wouldn't be very good right now with COVID-19 <laughs> going on. But you know, otherwise, so part, of, part, of, part of that part of that game had a, a quiz, and the language thing had a quiz. So when you were done, or toward the, towards the end of it, you could practice your skills, right? And so you, a word would come out, and it was the early days of speech recognition technology. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a word would come up, and you were supposed to say it, right? You had a headset headset on. You would say the word, and if you said it right, then Gowron would congratulate. He'd probably say "kaplop" or something like that. Yeah. But if you said it wrong, then someone would say, you said, oh, and you should have said, ooh, or you said, ka, and you should have said, ka, or whatever yeah. it was. And that was my voice uh, oh. making the corrections. And when the game first came out, I was at a Star Trek convention uh, in Alabama, actually. And the game was, they, they showed it there, but you couldn't buy it yet. You could pre-order it, but you couldn't buy it. But you could play it, try it out. So I went straight to the language lab. Because that was the part I cared about, right? And went to the quiz at the end to see how I did. And the thing came up and it said, I remember the words, it said, kapla. So I said, kapla. And then I heard me say, no, you said ka. And you should have said ka. And I said, no, computer, I said it right. You got it wrong. As we said, funny. early voice recognition. <laughs> yeah, early days of voice recognition. Yeah. That's funny, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I didn't know. Uh, speak Klingon, please, you all. Kazume oh. Matsumoto. <laughs> Is that? <laughs> 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 it's a, it's a yeah, the only thing, the only, you know, I, I had to the learn, all. and I learned it phonetically for the, um, what was it that uh, Hillary Bader wrote? Uh, 
Well, she wrote the script for that for that game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think. So the CD, I think. Yeah. In which case, that was – but Bob, uh, they had cue cards. They had cue cards outside the view screen. So yeah. on the spaceship, you know, because oh. they're – it's yeah. hard for those guys to stand out there on the actual spaceship while we're in space with the cue cards because they just it's there's no wind resistance, but it's really hard to manage. <laughs> but um, uh, she wrote, I, and I kept the cue cards, and she signed them as well as um, McCart. Uh, is it McC who wrote that song, the Warriors Anthem? Is it Michael McCarthy? McCarthy? I don't know who wrote the song. I wrote. I they sent me the lyrics in English. Oh, the lyrics just, in English. Just the lyrics, because they yeah. right. They wrote the lyrics in English, and I said to them, "Well, how do, how does the song go? If I'm supposed to translate this into Klingon, I need to know what the melody of the song is." And this was. I don't think we had email. I don't know how we did anything. Um, so they couldn't send me the music Why? to listen to. Huh. So what they did is they marked, they sent me uh, uh, the English with lines, like bar lines, okay? Wow. Marking off the different measures and counting the beats. And so I matched it to that, and that's what that's, and I had no idea what it was going to sound like until the CD came out. And it worked. Well, the strangest now lyric, singing. that first line, the strangest lyric is like, it's like baby talk. It's, Koi Kales Puk Lod. Very good plural. That doesn't sound very Klingon. Not by itself, no. No. But uh, I thought it sounded very Klingon. Now I have a question. Uh, um, do you know a Klingon speaker in Alaska, Mark? No. Um, you don't know a, a woman named Pillow. Pillow. Actually, Pillow. Oh, that's, that's Pillow. Yes. I didn't know she was in Alaska. Yeah. Oh, I was she still there. She might have moved into the uh, contiguous 48. Yeah. But um, when Bob and I went up to do a show in Alaska, uh, we ran across this person. And then we ran across her again in Vegas. They There was a Klingon presentation. And she danced the uh, dance of seven... Uh, Klingon shields, dance of the seven shields, and uh, an incredible dancer. She's a burlesque artist, but she has done. She speaks Klingon, Klingon. as well as anybody. Well, I've heard met a lot of people who speak Klingon, and there's actually, a number of people who speak Klingon. Yeah, probably yeah. Some of us I mean, watching us right now. A lot better than I ever could. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I've been known to make up a lot of Klingon as. As we go. Thank you. She still is in Anchorage. She's still in Anchorage. Yeah. All right. Well, hello, 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 hello. Hey, we, we <laughs> say hi. We say hi, Pillow. Kapla. And it was a wonderful, uh, fun time in Vegas. But it was not in a any kind of um, uh, place. It was in the middle of the desert, and it was we had. Uh, it was it was fabulous. The lighting was fabulous. The fun was fabulous. The food was well. It was Klingon. It was frightening. Uh, it was frightening. Food, but but the food, you know, it was all wonderful. Fortunately, we had so much to drink, we couldn't taste anything. You know, after about <laughs> we ended up dancing on the table. It was a good Klingon uh, event. Yes, it was a great Klingon event. Yeah, <laughs> literally in the desert, there were like twelve Klingon. Lords, Klingon admirals, thought admirals everywhere uh, surrounding a circular stage. The only lighting was torches uh, around the stage, which was fabulous. In the middle of the desert. <laughs> yeah, it was phenomenal. I, I actually passed out about after the first half hour, so I didn't see much of anything. Bob might have seen more than me. Well, actually, after you passed out, JG, they, they built a suburb around you, right, right <laughs> in that vicinity. It was, it was rather yeah. quick, and you woke up, and, and you yeah. had a city around you, another Thank city. You. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, that was... Uh, Mark, I, I don't know... Uh, I don't know if I was ever pronouncing this, the, the, the words correctly on the Klingon anthem. Uh, could you do? Do you know it, Mark? No, no. There's there's people watching who know it. But I don't remember it anymore. I'm sure there quite, are people who know it. Quite, out there. Yeah, he, he probably knows it. You got that right. Yeah, he knows it. 
But uh, yeah, I know we've run into several Klingons around the world that do speak. Uh, they've got your book. They memorize the uh, conjugations. You know the the declination. Can you decline? Uh, you can decline to speak Klingon if you wish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, let's, 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 let's not talk. Uh -oh. Let's not talk only about me here. Go away. Well, then let's talk about me. Um, Bob, what do you think of me? Well, I, I like the story that you tell of, of uh, the audition and that you didn't know any Klingon and what you did in the place of Klingon with the uh, Frakes in the first audition for a Klingon you ever had. Well, your CD ROM. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. from your CD rum. Well, they had a little sequence of Klingon, about four lines in Klingon, Mark. And I said, ah, oh, this is going to be embarrassing. I don't know any Klingon. I have no idea what they mean. I have no idea how to say the words. So I said, I'm, I'm not going to, I'll substitute some other language, um, French or no, French. French. Have you ever met a French Klingon? <laughs> um, Almost. On, actually, yeah. on, on, on the third <laughs> Star Trek three, French came up. We did French do a French show French. in uh, in Paris where we, we had a, uh, a fight to the death with baguettes and French flags. Uh, <laughs> Which one? And we got on stage beating each other to death with baguettes. It yes. was yes. very exciting. Oh, that was very exciting. Yes. Um, but the, so I said, what am I going to do? So I said, oh, I know, I'll speak Latin because I had memorized many years earlier. I, my mother was a Latin teacher and I spoke Latin because I didn't know, I, I didn't know better. Um, I learned, I took too many classes in Latin. Anyway. In Pennsylvania, um, Amish yeah. and speaking Latin. What a combination. Wow. Yeah, it's very, it's very similar to Amish, uh, by the way. Um, <laughs> but. Klingon? Uh, I, I, I got to the Klingon part and I said, Wolf, you must, you do not understand. Yeah, pose great Todd Mabutere, Catalina, Patientia, Nostrum, Cramble, feed him, no saluted. Imovero, Insonatus, I can tell it. And you know, because I memorized this fourth oration against Catalina, where he's angry. I said, hmm, that fits. Um, yeah. If Cicero really ever got angry, I mean, Cicero. You know, Cicero never got angry, really. Catiline did. Anyway, um, but uh, uh, so Frakes started well, he laughing. had to wash his underwear. Uh, uh, Frank started laughing and said, uh, I have never heard anybody speak Klinga, speak uh, Latin at an audition before. <laughs> um, and he was just laughing at me. And, and, I, we were, and he said, <laughs> But I love Latin. <laughs> so I'm there's nothing for you in this CD ROM as it exists, but I'm gonna ask the writers to write you in. So they wrote me in a little tiny part. Um, but it was because my mother was a Latin teacher that uh and that was my beginning with Star Trek. Latin. Cool. Cool. So you came in linguistically. That's that's cool. Yes, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yeah. So that, that's all the language. The other, the other kind of questions I get sometimes have nothing to do with the language, but everyone asks about the makeup and what's involved in that. How long, how long does it take? What does it feel like all day long? Is it comfortable or is it hard to act in it? Or do you have to act differently under all that makeup than you would if you weren't making makeup, wearing that makeup? Well, it, it, it was, uh, it, it, the, it, the easy answer is the makeup was pretty ingenious and it was okay. It was fine. The hair uh, uh, was miserable, made us extremely hot. And they started adding wigs and bouffants to my, because I was royalty or whatever. And, and they, it just got worse and worse and worse. And the real kicker was the costumes, which did not breathe and were horrible and I cursed the day every day that I had to put it on the person who created it because it looked great, but it was not fun. And you would lose, I would lose between six and 11 pounds a day of liquids. Wow. You know, uh, it was you bad. Wish. I did. I did. Of course, I could lose it in those days. I had plenty of it. You know, plenty to spare, but, uh, um, 
you are a very delicate, uh, fragile thing, Bob, because that that costume, it never bothered me, but you reacted to the neoprene too, right? Yeah, I became allergic to the neoprene and it almost killed me once. It was, um, uh, I didn't Damn, really so it. close. <laughs> You would have you would have been in there a lot earlier, you know. Yes. And the doctor yes. finally said to me, he said, "You put that on again, and, and you're going to have a I don't figure what they call it, but some kind of a, uh, a shock that'll just stop your heart." And uh, so I had to inform the producer that I could not wear the neoprene anymore. But that was just an undercoating; it wasn't the actual, you know, outer layer of the costume. So. It was pretty easy fix. I just didn't, well, I didn't know. know I didn't know you wore a neoprene. You were you had a neoprene vet, huh? Underneath. Yeah, yeah, un oh. yeah. This and underneath the the big heavy leather. Uh, uh, yeah. Stuff. Real yeah. leather. Yeah. That was sweet. You know, yeah, I remember. You remember during the filming of, of Star Trek Five, one of the characters uh, was a, a a large older Klingon character named Cord, who was played by Charlie Cooper. Oh, yeah, wow. Cooper. Yeah, yeah. And he had a big cape-like thing uh, that he wore. It was very, very heavy and a big pain to get it on. So they didn't want to take it on and off and on and off during the day, as, as they were shooting. That was the Klingon robe. So that right? was, an, and yeah. it was still there. And I inherited it. And it was and really it hot. So it was so hot that they they had a little air conditioner built into it. So after every scene, he'd go off to the side and plug himself in. And be air conditioned. Oh, I didn't know that until now, and that, now I want to kill somebody because <laughs> they should have kept that air. Because I would talk, I would go in and say, you know, th this is a real. I'd have the the cape, you know, with whatever. It is. And I go in to the director every time, and I'd say, you know, this is really a relaxed scene. Um, it, it's really relaxed. It, it's just kind of talking to each other. So. You don't mind. I'll, I'll get rid of the the cape, the cape, and and this went on for a couple of shows, and they all bought it. Every director I talked into it, and then finally, the director said to me, he said, "We know what you're doing. You're wearing the cape from that one." <laughs> so I had to wear the cape, and and it was and the first time I wore it after that, I had a a, a scene with uh, Avery, and um, uh. I was walking, and because they never, they never changed the cloak. They never cut it for me. For it would drag on the floor everywhere. Charlie was a big guy. Yeah, yeah he was a big guy, and he, he was also a war hero. He, he went up to the, the Hawk in, in Normandy, and um, uh, survived it. Anyway, he was a ranger. Uh, the camera would move, and it would roll over my cloak, and I would go like this to the camera. And and they and they always blamed it on me. They said, "Well, keep your cape out of there." And I said, "It's behind me. I can't see where the cameraman is." <laughs> Just somebody tape it up. And anyway, it went on for a while. Uh, I hated that cape. Yes. And you got the cape. You. Yes, okay. but I studied very. I studied with Mira Rostova, the famous Russian acting teacher who had worked with Stanislavski. So I knew one of, the, one of the cardinal rules is don't step on somebody's cape and don't bump into the furniture while you're acting. So, so instead, you bump into the camera. I'm a, I'm a trained actor, you see. Yes, though. yes. He he actually bumped into the camera lens. Right. Well, I knocked him over, actually. <laughs> And literally not a this good thing over. to do to a cameraman. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, did you draw on previous yeah. characters from other pieces you had performed or read? Angel Castillo. Well, yeah, for, with me, yes. I I, um, uh, uh, I was doing. I was in the middle of doing when I got the audition. I was in the middle of doing Lear, King Lear, downtown, nice huge theater. And I was doing Edmund LA in Theater. theater. And, LA Theater Company, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the LA and, Actors Theater, sorry. Yes. And <laughs> there were a lot of similarities um, between uh, Edmund and, and Gowron and uh, Outsiders. That was the description that I was an outsider and I was um, uh, unwelcome and um, uh, 
my there was all sorts of stuff and but they it was very similar and i used a lot of what i was actually doing in that play to bring into the character uh which is part about what the eyes were all about too that became sort of uh uh frank just definitely just said do the eyes all the time and, and I was, so the first time you did the eyes you were not in makeup when, when he said that right mm -hmm. It, yeah, yeah, um, yes, exactly. I was not in makeup, and and uh, and I, and it, it was because they asked me to do um, the role very Machiavellian, you know, just and uh, and very sort of quiet. And I did it, and I bored the hell out of them. And and then uh, it, it, Frank said, "Okay, let's see the other side of the Klingon. Let's you know go all the way." And and so I went all the way. I went, you know. <laughs> Ah! And and uh, he said the eyes, the eyes, just keep the eyes. And when I got to the set, I didn't do the eyes. And he said, "No, I want the eyes, the eyes, Bob." And and I said, "What eyes?" And he went, "Oh no, not one of those actors, yeah. you know." So <laughs> I knew what he was saying, but I was like, I was trying to be a little more subtle because it was filmed. But Klingons can't be subtle. So no. I, I've learned that after many years of uh, doing the eyes. I don't think the word subtle is, does that exist in the Klingon language? I don't think, well, I thought it did in the beginning because they said, <laughs> well, I'm right. asking Mark, you know, <laughs> who wrote the language. Who doesn't remember all the words. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote it so long ago. <laughs> there are strangely missing words, you know, such as, excuse me, uh, missing expressions in the Klingon language. Yeah. <laughs> Or please, yeah, the, 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 the Wikipedia article about the Klingon language uh, pointed out that, that the vocabulary is limited uh, and it's sort of easier to talk about outer space or something like that than it is to talk about every, everyday things. So it said, for example, there's a word for bridge, meaning the bridge on a ship, but there's no word for bridge, meaning the bridge over water. So I saw that in Wikipedia and said, well, now there is. Beep, 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 beep. Right, right. So we, we can <laughs> well, why would you need a bridge over water? You just go through it. Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> it had to make up a, a, a number of words uh, over the years. One, uh, there was a project that I worked on, helped, helped out with a, a few years ago. There was a... Uh, Actually, someone someone who I saw earlier in the, in, in the chat thing is actually watching uh, with us from, from England. It was a, a, a CD or a DVD or something. It was one of those discs that no one has anymore for learning Klingon. But it was the words in it were Earth words. What I mean by that is they were all, the vocabulary was things that you don't find on the Klingon planet or on a spaceship or something like that. They're just everyday Earth things, the same kind of vocabulary you would find if you were learning French or Spanish or Swahili or something or other on Earth. So I had to come up with lots of words for Earth things. And while we were doing this, I was thinking, why why are we doing this? Because a language learning thing, if, I'm, if I speak English and I want to go to France, I get a thing, a, a CD that'll teach me French, right? So I can use it when I go to France. Mm -hmm. But if I'm an English speaker and I'm learning Klingon, I should learn words that'll help me if I go visit the Klingons on their planet, not if I go visit the Klingons downtown. Hmm. Right. But we did it anyway and had to come up with words for non-Klingon things like toothpaste, you know, and aspirin. <laughs> the, well, Klingon, the Klingon word for aspirin is nuchherg. <laughs> which means coward's medicine. You beat me to it. I was just about there. Just about to say it, yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> to JG and Bob, have your portrayals of Klingons influenced other roles you've done since Star Trek? Did Garen and Martok's warrior spirits live on in other characters? Well, not for me. Um, uh, 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 Garen was it, and, and uh, I figured uh, I better not go there again. Uh, somebody would call me on it if I did. Uh, uh, JG? Well, I borrow everything from you, Bob. So uh, my performance 
on Scrabble? Scrabble and whatnot after yeah. DS9. It had nothing to do with my performance, but I just stole everything I could from you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, you know, the, we are who we are. And any actor who is, has a, any degree of honesty in their performance is going to borrow from everything they have in life. Um, and certainly I have. Um, I'm trying to think the, I've often said that Klingons are basically a, a race of linebackers. And since I was a linebacker in college uh, playing football, and I, my, my single purpose in life as a linebacker was to stop the other person, period. You know, hurt them if I had to but just stop them from doing whatever they were doing. That fits really well into the Klingon mentality, I think. I, I think so, too. See, I was a wide receiver and a halfback, so. You, you were more like a, like a Romulan, well, then. You were more like a, like a Romulan or a. No, I was a rabbit. I was a rabbit. I was like, I would, I was fast, very fast. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to catch me on a football field. But if you did, you would have been a Yeah. <laughs> you were a classical uh, uh, football That's player. why you would never catch me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could now. Um, Another question. Are there any aspects of Klingon culture you wish were explored? Actually, I was going to ask that too. This is good. Well, sex was not one of them. That was <laughs> definitely a no-no. Um, uh, I think Klingons might actually kill each other in, in that realm. But um, no, not. It, it, I thought about the sex, though. I mean, it was like if we explored that area. Blah, 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 blah. Well, Worf had to explore it a little bit. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he got got to do all the all the wonderful things. I got, you know, I got to uh, battle, uh, just fight all the time, fight, fight, fight. I don't think the Klingons had ever piloted a starship that was out exploring the universe for uh, scientific reasons. You know, we were we we were out there. If we were flying a starship. Um, it was to conquer somebody. Yeah, it was yeah. basically to attack or protect against an attack. Yeah. Um, as opposed to, you know, that nice little tingly music when. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that doesn't go with a Klingon. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Jerry yeah. Goldsmith theme. Yeah. Oh, uh, when 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 you were once you were cast and had been doing your your particular role for a while, when you were filming something other, did you ever do something or suggest something to add to the scene or add to the character or something like that? That the director or producer said, "No, no, don't do that," but you thought would have been really good. Uh, there was something in the last scene when I died, and and I for, and now I forget what it was, uh, but it. He he liked the idea, but he said, no, Bob, because they're pulling the plug. We can't shoot it. And mm. it, it was the very last thing I was ever going to do. Uh, and I came up with, I thought was a good idea. And he, he did too. And, and it, in the beginning, when I first told him, he said, great, we'll, we'll, we'll do an insert and do that. On your death, and I forgot what it was. And then we got to it, and I said, "We haven't, you know, done this yet." And he said, "We're not going to because they're pulling the plug on me." It was two a.m. in the morning, and, uh -huh. and uh, that was it. So I never got to do it, whatever the hell it was. You know? uh, uh, I don't know. The, I'll think about it. But JG, anything? Well, I wasn't it the fact that you wanted to be on the second floor of the promenade where you could break through the break through the thing and, you know, get, get shot with a disruptor or something and, ha! and then fall forward like 12, 15 feet 
called to a, a, a stunt man that had put out the, uh, you know, you had a you had a big plan you talked about. Um, what? I, I never did. I'm lying. <laughs> what what yeah. was the question? Yes. No, the question was, uh, what was the question? No, it was, it was. Oh, I know. Did you yeah, think of anything that the director or the producer said, no, no, we don't like that. Yeah, you thought it was yeah. a great idea. And you thought it was a good idea and you wanted to do it. No, the only thing I suggested was in the, in uh, Once More Into the Breach with John Colicos, who came to have a uh, honorable death, um, which that pertains slightly to this badge I'm wearing. This badge is from Tolkien, the um, Tea Club uh, Barovian Society, uh, TCBS. And it, it was about uh, having an honorable death, whether it's Viking or, uh, and they actually mention this on Wikipedia, they actually mention or a, the Klingon dishonorable death would send you to Grethor, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it has a connection with Tolkien. Anyway, um, now I forgot the question. Oh, I asked, uh, I asked Ron Moore, wrote the, wrote the episode, and I asked if I could add something because what Kolokos's motivation for getting an honorable death, it involved the fact that he had kept me, Martok, from, from uh, going to officer candidate school, basically, to be a, because I was a, not of noble birth. Uh, I, was, I was from a garbage dump, basically. And, um, uh, and I said, can I add a line uh, near the end of that long speech, just add a line that says, unfortunately, my father did not live to uh, see the day that I did become an officer, despite core. But that's why I would not accept core's. I, I said, no, you can't have an honor of death. I'm not giving you anything. And I took it to the, I was, you know, I told the, they said, well, the writer said, but we want to like Martok. We want to like him. I said, I don't care. I, you know, I, I am not giving that man an honorable death. Screw it. Um, so somehow he got one, but it was over my dead body almost. Um, uh, but he said, I asked Ron if I could add that line because I wanted to add it because it was like my own father died fairly young um, and he never saw any of my work in theater, television, film, anything. Um, and he would have been surprised because he was an Air Force colonel, retired Air Force colonel, and we're in Korea and uh, uh, the end of World War II. But um, anyway, uh, I asked him if I could add that line, and Ron said, absolutely. And uh, it really made that sequence. Worf was saying, why do you hate him so much? You know, why do you, why do you hate Kor? And I explained why, and that was the last sentence to wrap it up. Uh, but yeah, and they were very persnickety. You couldn't add a vast. Just got some support here. Yeah. What? You just got some support here on the. Yes, uh, I'm man. Our, 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 our core. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Helen. I I need all the support I can get, <laughs> and as the years go by, I need even more support. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? Uh, it's not important. If, if I was saying it, it's not really that important. Yeah, and I, I sort of had the same kind of experience that he had. I didn't get no's. I got yeses. Uh, the show I said that um, all, all the traditional things, um, uh, the ritualistic things that uh, uh, Patrick and I w sort of put our heads together, and and he was very into it. Uh, uh, and a lot of the, that stuff actually came from stuff that I used to do as a child because I was in like um, very strange groups, but I was, I was like an altar boy for a while. And I, I put in some of that stuff. And, and also I was in a sort of a, a military thing as a child too uh, in Manhattan. And uh, we put in a lot of the military things that, that, that uh, this whole thing, you know, this, 
I mean, was probably in the, but I, but I said, well, why don't we turn or do something like that? And, and that was uh, a suggestion. Uh, Wait a minute. This is Wakanda forever. Was it Klingon? It's you know, I don't know where it stemmed from, but I, we saw it. Somebody did it. I think it was um, another actor and we thought it was a great idea. And, uh, and then, but the turn was actually something that we, I said, well, we could turn at the same time, but it, it would be, you know, it would be even better if, if they did it singly. Uh, I don't know exactly, remember exactly how that turned out or, um, but it was like, we were all putting our heads together and, and, but any suggestions that I made or other people made oftentimes were accepted. Uh, and they, you know, and a lot of shows that you got poo pooed or, or whatever. Um, uh, Cosmo was the script supervisor on that show. And, and he, he was, he, he came from a lot of other shows that I had done. So I was, you know, I knew him pretty well. And, uh, I would pass things by him. And he said, yeah, yeah, go, 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 go talk to the director. Patrick's, you know, go, go talk to Patrick. You know. Let me, because this is yesterday, I guess, was the, there was a, an explosion of comments about Aaron and Renee on the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, let me, can I say something real quickly? Uh, a story with Renee. Uh, I, you know, I adored Aaron. I, I adored him. I, I adored the fact that he would he would photobomb every chance he could get. Uh, <laughs> you know, for the last twenty years, we've been Mark the family involved in what Gene Roddenberry created, and you're part of the family. You're like a you're like a uh, like an uh, an adult <laughs> in the family. Um, but the family has existed now since since it was created by Roddenberry and it's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's all very close. Um, but uh, Renee uh, in uh, far beyond the stars, Mark Zacree, you know, the episode that he wrote in DS nine. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, far beyond the stars. It had a sequence where um, Renee his character had to get really angry at uh, at Avery when Avery was insisting on presenting his own paintings and whatnot, his own his own uh, script um, for the comics, and and I, I was sitting off stage. I had finished my bit, and I was sitting off stage, probably eating something in one of those director's chairs, and they came. They were. I heard this. Uh, this contretemps, this, and they came out shouting at each other, and uh, 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 it was um, it was Avery who was directing, and Renee who was acting at that point. And Avery said, "I want, I want a, um, I want so much more of a uh, an anger, a very angry anger, anger." And Renee said, "That's what I did." Uh, he said, "No, no, no, I need more. I need need much more. I'm making a a, a red hot anger." And and Renee said, "I that, that's that's exactly what I did. I was giving." He said, "No, no, no. I I what I want. What I want is white hot anger." And Renee goes, "That's what I did." Die! He was screaming, and and uh, and Avery said, "That's it. That's what I want. That's it." And Renee said, "Well, that's mine. You can't have it." <laughs> Absolutely. I have never heard that before or after in my work as an actor. I've never heard that comment. But Renee was was a genius, God bless him. And that genius could come up with stuff that nobody's ever seen or heard before. You know? That's mine! <laughs> and you can have it! <laughs> yeah. That one's hard to follow. Um, let, let, let me ask the question in sort of in reverse. Did, did you ever do anything by accident that after you did it, the director said, "Great, let's keep that." Um, I, I did, but not on that show. I, I <laughs> but it, it, it's like I, I, actually in the reverse of what you actually said. I, but it, it's another show. It's okay. really so. Um, uh, I did something which they really didn't, by accident, which they really didn't want to keep. 
I fell asleep. It was a long day. <laughs> it was a long, long day. And it was like 15, 18 hours, maybe 20 hours that day. And we, it was a dark set because we were on the prison planet. And Andy Robinson, Derek, was talking to his dying father, who was an incredible actor. I love this man. But uh, God, who played his father? Ah, uh, uh, I can't think of the name. I hate it. I hate it. Um, but he had a very quiet scene saying, Father, if you know, if if you could only accept what I am and who I am, you know, and I was in the background on a cot in a well, place. That was Andy Robinson doing that. Yeah. And it was like, Father, please under in the background. <laughs> and and the next thing I remember is Andy's face right over top of me saying, JG, let me get through the scene once. Please. <laughs> I said, was I asleep? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know that is just the biggest no no if you can imagine it on a in a in a theater production or film or tough you know who used to do that all the time in in the in the John Ford movies was Victor McLaughlin when yeah. was given it you know he had to sit in the chair he would, had to sit in the chair all day long because they knew if he left he just disappear and they they'd never get him back so uh so, but he would, he, John Wayne would be doing a scene with Ward Bond, and that's exactly what McLaughlin would do. And, and Ford would have to wake him up. John Ford would have to wake Victor McLaughlin up. He was always. <laughs> Can you guys hear my dog barking now? No, I can't hear anything. She's having I, a fit. I can barely hear you. They but, see hey, things. Right, hey, animals see hey, things. Hey, right right there. There. Anyway, I'm going to change change gears a lot right now because we have a question that was that was uh, based on a survey done on the social media for the museum, and they they wanted to know. So, ask you guys, who would win a battle between a Klingon and a Predator? Uh, I'd win, uh, but JG would lose. That's the simple question. But truthfully, a predator, they're pretty wild. Those guys are pretty wild. What do you think, JG? Oh, that'd be, I mean, you just got to keep moving, Bob, because they're in that suit. It is so freaking hot in that suit, you know? <laughs> and they're, they're a really tall guy anyway. I, there, where was you know, A guy like me who's, who's a running guy would, would make yeah, survive. Yeah, yeah. They, they like you to just, get nailed yeah no no i no I, i'd have to go with predator because they could they could disappear i we know had a cloaking device i don't know how they got it on their body but why didn't cling on it well they they, they had cloaking device vulcans would, have dis vulcans would have discovered that one you know yeah you're right Klingons, we just like to fight you know why plus why you know Klingons were not the sharp and we wouldn't be able to fight if we disappeared you know? Klingons were not the sharpest tool in the shed. We, uh, oh, we no, fought. we were not the brightest. You know, we fought. We no. fought phasers with bat lifts, with things that had so many points on it that it, it cut us when we used it against somebody else. On the, on I, that I, I, got, I got attacked once by the the original bat lift, the, the, the oh. prototype bat lift. Well, you did. I, I did by Dan Curry. Dan Curry hit me with the bat lift. Not on purpose. Whoa. Did Whoa, he you knew how to use it too, since he yeah. kind of invented oh, well, it. Was my fault. Yeah. It was it was my fault. We were we were on we were at a convention and we were double billed. I don't know why they did that, but so I talked for a little while, and then I sat down, and then he talked, and it was we had a microphone for that with a cord on it, uh, and so he was talking. Then he went to get the bat left to show off, show how it works. And he put the microphone down. So when he came back and was starting to talk, people couldn't hear him anymore. So I thought I would be helpful. And I got the microphone and held it up to his mouth just as he was swinging the thing around. 
<laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. No, uh, you know, Dan Curry is a frighteningly trained soldier. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. He could have killed you with a piece of paper. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't mess with Dan Curry. <laughs> Well, I learned that right didn't away. Know that at that time, at that point. <laughs> so let's 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 now do do some time travel, because you guys, your 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 characters were Klingons, presumably in the twenty fourth century. There's, there's a, we talked about this a little bit already, but there's a whole lot of Klingon activity activity now in the twenty first century because the future influences the past, right? So there's things like like the Klingon assault group. Uh, or CAG, which is a group of Klingon Klingon fans, and CAG Canada, Canada spelled with a K. Yeah, great, uh, great group uh, up there. They're a great, yeah. fabulous group, fabulous. Yeah. And JJ and I have gone up there, and and we've even renamed a street up there. That's called, right. I was there. Uh, oh, that's right. We were all there. We were all there. And it was. It's now called the Klingon Way. Klingon oh, Way. JJ, oh, you were there for that one, but it's yeah. called the Klingon Way. Right. Uh, in, in, in the town of Vulcan. In Vulcan, yeah. In Vulcan, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And on the language side, of course, there's the Klingon Language Institute, which are the folks who study the language, you know, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of, of things you can get and do now uh, in Klingon. Uh, you, can, you can read literature of various kinds, uh, translations of uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Tao Te wow. Ching, the, 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 the Sun Tzu's Art of War, The Little Prince, which is, of course, a classic Klingon story. Hamlet. Uh, and there's Shakespeare. Yeah, we should talk about yeah. Shakespeare, shouldn't we? <laughs> Definitely have the Hamlet. Yeah. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's that scene There's that scene in Star Trek VI where the uh, Klingon... Julius is, Caesar, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where where uh, the, the Klingons and the Federation are having a big banquet on the Enterprise. And the, the chancellor, then chancellor, before you guys came along, uh, Chancellor Gorkhan, who's David Warner, um, said he'd like to propose a toast. And he says, to the undiscovered country. And nobody knows what he's talking about, but of course Spock does. He says, ah, oh, it was Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1. I might have the numbers wrong. Right. Because that's part of the undiscovered country, part of the right. to be or not to be speech. And then Gorkhan says, uh, you have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. And then Christopher Plummer says, tach, 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 which means to be or not to be in Klingon. And, and because of that scene, the members of the Klingon Language Institute said, well, you know, if, the, if Shakespeare was originally written in Klingon, then we owe it to the galaxy not to translate, but to restore all the works of Shakespeare Absolutely. back to the original Klingon, right? So the first one they did was Hamlet, and they've done much ado about nothing. There's there's a, a bit of Julius Caesar. I think Romeo and Juliet is finished, although it's not it's not available yet. There's well, some the thing about some the of the, about some the lines were Palmer. changed, and JG knows some of the original lines. Yes, the, uh, he worked on the uh, to be and not to be, uh, you know, the, but that's that's not the original Camerax. The original. Here's the thing. K the great poet Kemerex, um Klingon poet. Klingon mm -hmm. poet. Uh, Shakespeare was has in his lifetime. Shakespeare had about eleven years where he disappeared from the face of the planet. Ah. <laughs> he basically, if they're called the hidden years, and. He suddenly reappeared in London, and he had started writing these brilliant plays. The thought is, and I, I actually have some of the proof of this, but uh, he was abducted uh, by a Klingon ship in uh, Hyde Park. And um, during the period of 11 years that he spent aboard that Klingon ship and on Kronos, he came across the origi these original texts by Kemerex, and he started translating them. The original Klingon, um, uh, um, Christopher Plummer almost had it correct, but the original Klingon was not to be or not to be. It was very close, but the original Klingon went to stab or not to stab. 
That is not even a question. <laughs> that's the original Klingon. That's the original. That's actually, that's actually better than the real story. So um, it is because, <laughs> because that the line, the line to be or not to be, was not originally in the script for Star Trek Six to be in Klingon. Right. And then, and I arrived on the set one day, and, and the, the director of that, Nick Meyer, says, "Oh, good. I'm glad you're here. I have another line to add in as Klingon." And I said, "You know, what's that?" He says, "To be or not to be." And I said, okay, because that's what I'm supposed to say. And I thought, oh no, because I made a big stink in, in, the, in, the, in making up the grammar and in writing about it in the dictionary that in Klingon, there's no verb to be. To be. <laughs> so I said to him, what, what, if, what if it means, I'm trying to think of an alternative really quick. I said, what if it, what if it means to live or not to live? He said, okay. Cool. Go tell Chris. Chris means Christopher Plummer, <laughs> Shakespearean actor. <laughs> well, I go over to Christopher Plummer. Now, I wasn't ever sure that Christopher was enjoying speaking Klingon or not for a while until he started calling me Mark all the time. <laughs> anyway, I go over to him and he says, I understand you. You have a line for me. Yes. Okay, say it. And the word, uh, at, at that point, the, the, the Klingon dictionary was published. When I worked on Star Trek III, I could make stuff up on the fly because it didn't, nothing existed before. But by the time of Star Trek uh, five and six, the book was out. So I had to pay attention to the book. I could add stuff to it that, you know, that wasn't in the book. But if it was in the book, I had to pay attention. So the word for live was yin, yin. So to live or not to live, there's a number of different ways to do it. But what I did was live or live not, which is yin par, yin be, live or live not. Yin par, yin be. And he goes, yin, yin? And I said, yeah, he says, that, that, that's too wimpy. That's not what he said, but that's what he meant. Think of something else. So, ah, what am I going to do? So I said, what, what, what if we say, tach, pach, tach, be? He goes, tach, tach is good. Let's keep tach. <laughs> Up until that moment, tach was a suffix that you put on a verb that would mean to continue doing whatever the verb is. So walk plus talk means keep on walking, continue walking. Uh -huh. But I kind of promoted it to be a verb in its own right. So it means to go on, to continue, to endure. So tach, yeah. tach, tach ben means to go on or not to go on, to continue or not to continue. And that fit. And when we yeah. shot the scene, when we shot the scene, we shot that scene on uh, in the dining room there. It took two days because they shot it from every conceivable angle with every conceivable configuration of who was in the shot. Wow. Over and over and over, and the, the Klingons and the and the Federation people were supposed to be eating this food, which was prepared for the Klingons. So it was red and blue and all these different colors. They weren't eating very much. The, uh, William Shatner, uh, not Shatner, uh, uh, Nick, the director, said, "You got to eat the food. I'll, I'll pay you five dollars, twenty dollars, or something. Whoever eats the most food." Anyway, <laughs> again and again, again, and when it was all over. The next day, and said, nobody remembered that line, even though everyone heard tach, pach, tach, bet 10,000 times. It was gone. Christopher Palmer didn't remember. Nobody remembered. The only person who remembered was George Takei, and he was not in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mark, it was funny watching you tell that story because as you were talking to Christopher Plummer, as you told this story, you actually looked incredibly nervous. <laughs> you were stuttering and looking around for inspiration. It was very funny to see. You relive that moment yeah. of terror <laughs> for us. Thank you. Yeah. Now, Christopher Plummer was, he had, he had an interesting insight when, the, the first, when I first met him, which was, you know, weeks before this. And he said, when, when he said I want to be able to speak this Kling, my Klingon lines really, really well. And they should be very fluid, very comfortable. He says, if I'm having trouble speaking something, it should be English, because Klingon is my first language. No, that was good. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then they kept cutting Klingon lines from him out of the script. I don't know what that was all about. But... Absolutely. <laughs> you know, uh, Patrick Stewart did um, a production of Othello later on at the Washington uh, Shakespeare Washington Theater. Theater. Here, yeah. Yeah. And Patrick was the only white uh, in the everybody else was black or brown. Patrick was the only white person in it, as a, just a reverse of the right, uh, right, show. right. The whole 
<laughs> but I told him, I even mentioned this later to him, I said, it, I, to me, it didn't work because nobody speaks Shakespeare better than Patrick Stewart. Nobody. I mean, uh, anyway. Not even me. No. <laughs> so, so the man most comfortable with the language was Patrick Stewart, the outsider. Mm -hmm. Everybody else. It didn't, it, you can't reverse that and still, if they would have been speaking something, a uh, foreign language, an African dialect of something, for instance, um, it, that might have worked. But when you're speaking English, an Englishman who has been with the Royal Shakespeare Company for 25 years, uh, speaking the, you know, the King's English, the Queen's English, the Queen, the Shakespeare's English, it just didn't work. Because he wasn't an outsider. He was the most in of all insiders. What was that uh, thing just came up? Did you see oh, that? It was, yeah, it was, it was a last minute reminder for the one-on-one -on -one conversations. With oh. You. Who would win a battle on Klingon and Predator? Can you ask the guys? You already asked that. Yeah, I did that. I, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't think, uh, the Predator was one, he was a bad mofo. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, I, I just don't think Unless um, you had the best idea, run away. Run away, run yeah. away, run away, run away. <laughs> yeah. To run live away. Day another day. Run away, run away. So, you know, talking about theater just now, there's, there's been, uh, in, in current times in this century, there's been Klingon theater that I don't know whether you guys have seen. You know, this is about we, 10, or, I saw 10 or 12 years tradition of. In Minnesota, did you see a Christmas Carol? Or uh, would you? I, I did see portions of it. I didn't see the whole thing. They did a portion of it. Yeah, the Klingon Christmas Carol has been done every year for the past 10, 12 years, except for the last couple. And again, I don't think it's going to be done this year for obvious yeah. reasons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, what's his name that produces that? Or um, Chris, Chris, Chris uh, Kidder Mostrom. Mostrom Kidder, whichever way it goes. Yeah. Yes, Kidder. That's yeah. right. Yes, uh, great guy, big fan, and uh, yeah, the, I never got a chance to see it. Yeah, uh, it's really maybe, good. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's really good. It's very funny. I've seen the book. Have you seen the book? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Oh, I love the book. Yeah. Uh, there was also a play in Stockholm a few years ago. Wow. That was. I heard about that. Yeah. And this was this was an interesting play. This was uh, for for Swedish actors. Uh, who were portrayed Klingons, and it was uh, a guide to visiting the Klingon planet, what you as an Earth person need to know to come visit the Klingon planet. But it was told, so it was about Klingon and human relations, but told from the point of view of Klingons, because what we tend to see on TV is the other way around, which was interesting. And there was supposed to be a play uh, in the Netherlands and uh, Belgium a little bit called Moo 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 as Klingon. Moo, moo, moo means words, words, words. Ah. And it was a riff on Hamlet. Polonius. Yeah. Oh, no, that's Hamlet says that too, Polonius. What are you reading, uh, Hamlet? Word, words, 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 words. Yeah, um, so uh, yeah. The, the, this Dutch theater group worked on uh, a Klingon. It was, it was Klingon and, and English. I don't know whether it was in Dutch or not. But anyway, it got hit by the pandemic. So it, there was a few. Oh, Never have so oh, oh, able to do that again. There's a huge what was the town that we went. We all went to. Schreveningen. Ning, 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 ning. What was it called? Schreveningen. Ning, ning. <laughs> it just it doesn't start. I mean, it, you know Dutch. It's Schreveningen. Get out of syllables. I, you know, I couldn't say any more syllables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a lot of lot of ens at the end of there. That that town, yeah. but it's on the beach. It was on the beach. It was basically a um, a beach city in the North Sea. Ah. Yeah. but well, you know, they did a product. There was a, there was a Klingon opera because Klingon is like opera, of course. We worked with the Klingon. Well, opera we actually did times. a Klingon opera in Italy. Yeah, ah. and we actually well, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was probably I a different. We actually an opera and then died, and then. Continued to sing as we were dead. Uh, and, yeah, and then neither one of us. Were, we we basically it was we're singing while we were 
fighting. Yeah. And eventually we were dying, but nobody would, neither one of us would give up being the last to, to live and sing. Right. So we kept coming back alive and singing, <laughs> one more verse. Yeah, the, re the reason I thought of it is because this Dutch company that did the, the Klingon opera called Oo, which means universe, uh, had one performance outdoors uh, in the rain, but they, they, they plowed on. Unfortunately, it's getting to be time to switch over uh, to end this conversation, which for me has been a lot of fun. I hope it's been fun for everybody watching it, wherever wherever you are all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, who cares about all those people, Mark? All those this people. is for us. It's for us <laughs> feel good. For those of you who signed up for the one-on-ones, that's coming up next. Uh, but for those of us here, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you to the museum for putting this together. Ah, this is what's coming up next time, October 28th, Women in Aerospace Engineering is the next program in this series, so watch for that. Rock you might see some of my neighbors. It might be. So, oh, oh JPL, right there. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're yeah. near the oh, fire. Laboratory. That's magic. So what do we do now, uh, Mark? Do we... Um... Oh, <laughs> everyone went away. <laughs>